You ready? Good morning, Vermont. Are we ready to rally for women? Are we ready to rally for freedom? Are we ready to rally for human rights and democracy? Then let's go. My name is Melinda Moulton, and I am your MC today. First off, let's give a rousing applause for Vermont's amazing Tyco drummers. Stuart Patton, Fran Stoddard, Karina Rose, Sylvie Vedrine, and Nikki Giraffe. Woohoo! Thank you, Tyco drummers. I want to recognize the folks in the crowd wearing pink vests. They are our rally ambassadors. And if you need anything or have any questions, please reach out to them. Thank you. Across the nation today, there are hundreds of thousands of folks marching and rallying for women. With just three days, with just three days before the most consequential election of our lifetimes, it feels so good to be here with all of you today. Thank you for being here. Throughout recorded history, women have fought for our autonomy, which is a fundamental human need. This means that we can make independent decisions that align with our personal values and goals, instead of being coerced by external forces. We must have the right to control our own bodies, the right to a fair and equal wage, a right to a right to love who we want to love, the right to have our gender identity honored, the right to live on a healthy planet, and the right to pursue our own destinies without punishment. Malala said, I raise up my voice not so I can shout, but so that those without a voice can be heard. Today, Vermonters are raising our collective voices in support of women, but also for all human beings, people of color, religious affiliation, Native Americans, physically and neurodiverse populations, our LGBTQ and gender affirming communities, and all who are denied their human rights. Our unwavering activism elevates awareness and provides strength purpose and positive change. We know this. We know this because when we help others to stand up and be heard, we stand stronger together. So here we are together under the State House Golden Dome with a statue of the Roman goddess Ceres in all of her glory. She is the goddess of agriculture and nourishment. Today, we will nourish ourselves with hope, truth, strength and love. Vermont, we are proud of what we stand for and what we stand up to because we, we are a powerful voice for the whole nation, a nation that is striving to navigate these challenging times. So let us begin. I now introduce to you singer-songwriter Patty Casey. being here. Um, we're going to sing a song, I Need Your Help With This. Some of you may know this. It's a song that I wrote in 2017 when we were looking at some dark times ahead and I needed to focus on something more positive than some of the feelings that I was having at the time. So I wrote a song called Stronger Than That and I would like for you to join me um, as you are able and willing because I believe that our voices can be heard. So you're gonna be singing, we are stronger than that, we are kinder than that, we are moving forward, we are not going back. We are stronger than that, we are kinder than that. 
Love is stronger than that. We are stronger than that. We are kinder than that. We are moving forward. We are not going back. We are stronger than that. We are kinder than that. Love is stronger than that. That's your part. It's going to come around a couple more times. When the storm is rolling in and our hopes start to fade, that's when we rise as one. Our spirits like a blade. We are many. We are mighty even when we are afraid. We are stronger than that. We are stronger than that. We are kinder than that. We are moving forward. We are not going back. We are stronger than that. We are kinder than that. Love is stronger than that. We will not yield to hatred to lies or to shame. Our power lives in courage, and our love, it is not tame. And if the lights go out on justice, we will light a flame. Cause we are stronger than that. Let's hear it. We are stronger than that. We are kinder than that. We are moving forward. We are not going back. We are stronger than we are kinder than that. Love is stronger than that. To everyone who's turned away, we open up our town. If fear can build a wall, then love can tear it down. And then we'll build a bigger table for all to gather around. Because we are stronger than that. going to speak along with Kaya Morris. Hehini washte mitaki api. Eya matakoyasi. Good morning, relatives. Chante washte nape chiyuzape ampetu. It feels good in our hearts to be with our relatives today. Oyasin aka an nazin tojipaha Ohan aglagla wenuski chokaya north branch wakpa. We stand amidst the green mountains and the intersections of the wenuski and the north branch rivers. Oyasin aka na chokaya cha ohani odnak and wodenak oyate. We stand on the ancestral, ancestral lands that was home to the spirit of the Odenak and the Wolanak people. Ehani Ashinabe, Echa, Ewejakiape, Itawa, indigenous Ampetu. Other nations such as the Anishabi also came here. Acknowledging the land that we live on requires us to honor those indigenous people who live here now. Self-identified people change the true history of this land and they take from our taxes and teach false narratives. 
Ehani Indigenous Oyate Chavlashka Kikawege Europeans. We recognize the indigenous culture and the people that extend long before the Europeans. Wakantanka Akan Unchimaka Ohan Wokshape Ohan Wanchintaka. We ask for strength and wisdom from all of our ancestors who are gathered here, standing beside us to guide us today. Kichi Kiza Lechiwa Wia Akan Vermont Ohan Oyate Akan Onak Ohan Wonak Wonaji Tanwan Yahipe. In the celebration of Vermont's commitment to ensure equality for women and to recognize the power that voters hold to fight for women's rights, the Odenak and Walanaki people welcome you. Thank you. Let us give a big welcome to Governor Madeline Kunin. <laughs> Vermont's, Vermont's first and only female governor who has spent her entire career working to further the lives of women. Thank you, Madeline, for being here. Thank you, thank you for making it possible for me to be here and to see so many women and some men who support us. We, we thank you. It's women who are going to decide the outcome of this election. We're out in force and we're going to be out in force all over the country. So I know everybody here has worked hard to support the Kamala and Walt. We know you've licked stabs, you made phone calls, you sent emails. So it's sort of audacious for me to say, don't stop now. You still, when they say this is a tight election, this is a tight election, which means, and I hate to even say this, it could go either way, and it's up to us to declare victory, because it will be our victory, and it will be glorious. But this is, it, you know, I'm 91 years old, so I've seen. <laughs> I've, I've seen some elections, and every election we say, this is the most important election of my lifetime. But this is the most important election of our lifetime. The whole question of women's autonomy, of our ability to control our own bodies, that is what is at stake. But it's not the only issue. The issue of the environment, the issue of education, the issue of energy, the issue of whatever moves you, I mean, because I hate to mention his name, but somebody, somebody on the other side has a plan, and we've heard about this plan, but we have to believe that he means it. If he, God forbid, wins, he will change our lives completely. And we can't, we can't let that happen. And we, he has no guardrails, no people who tell him you're crazy straight to his face. But we know, we know he, should I say this? He's crazy. <laughs> 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 uh, 
and he tells us he will protect us. Wow. No, thank you. Take your protection back. We are on our own. We're, we're smart. We're, we're strong. We're not your baby sister. We are equal to our big brothers. whether you like it or not. <laughs> I would just urge you one thing. If you haven't already done it, read Michelle Obama's speech. It was the most wonderful speech I've heard in a long time. And she, she said one thing amongst many things, but one of the things she said, take our lives seriously. Take our lives seriously. We're not a plaything. We're not beauty queens. We're human beings with certain rights and responsibilities. And we're here in the United States of America as equals. Even though we thank the men who are here and the men in our lives who are with us. Yes. But they still don't take us seriously. They still, too many men, I'm not speaking of all men, but I mean, the gender gap you could examine for a long time, but some people still want a strong man. And they think, especially in the wartime, you need to have a strong man for president. Well, we are equally strong. And so is Kamala Harris. She, she's done a remarkable thing that has never been done in history. In three months, mounted a stellar campaign that takes most people two or three years. Let's have a cheer for Kamala. We know there's a double standard. She's criticized for things that should kick Trump out of the race. But we're with her, Kamala. We're with you. And nothing will stop us. We're still going to make phone calls this weekend. We're still going to call our cousins in in Michigan and Pennsylvania and friends and urge them to vote because every vote will count and will make a difference. So, and you're here today shivering a little bit, but it shows your devotion and nothing is going to stop us. We're ready to fight. We're ready to fight. And we'll continue to fight until, yes, never before. When we fight, we win. We win. <laughs> Thank you, Mallory. Thank you, Governor. Thank you, Governor Kunin. Kamala, <laughs> not going back, not going back. So I would like to introduce you to Kaya Morris, who is a former member of the Vermont House of Representatives and a lead in the film Backlash, Misogyny in the Digital Age. Kaya. Thank you for being here.
This is exciting to be here. And I'll tell you why this is exciting. I had the honor of being able to be one of the speakers for the first Women's March on these very steps, on a very cold day where the streets were so packed that it went out to the highway. There were so many people that were invested in the belief, in the hope, that if we used our collective power, we could change things. We could make history. We can make it clear where our values are. We can make it distinct whose lives matter. We could enshrine within our political processes, within our community structures, within our homes, within our spirits, those things that make us human and those things that we must protect. It was a powerful, powerful day. And here we are again on this precipice of a really, really important moment in history. And so while I'm going to speak some hard truths, I'm also going to hopefully reflect back the hope that I'm seeing in the faces in front of me right now. These are some challenging times. The challenge is felt in these halls, on these streets, in conversations with our friends and our family, those who are questioning whether or not we'll be able to maintain the integrity of our democracy, and who gets to participate in that democracy. We're seeing voter suppression. We're seeing rampant violence. We're seeing misogyny to an unbelievable scale that moves at a pace faster than anyone can actually manage. And so while we are so proud to stand here today and declare that we are here to fight for future President Kamala Harris, I want you to recognize as well that there's a black woman on the ballot here in Vermont. And her story is not mine to tell, but her journey is one that resonates. Because she said in this moment of deep hatred, of violence, of threats, in this moment where my very voice could be silenced by someone who determined that I should not have access to power, that we have seen those who are cis white males who come from a Christian or patriarchal society be able to hold, we have seen that she chose to step up and say, I will be the change. And this was a scary journey and one that many did not believe could happen. We are driving throughout the state of Vermont and I see zero lawn signs for her. I am not standing here with her in this moment, and that says much. All of our friends who chose, who voted Republican, and have now decided that they want to join this fight, that we have carried on our backs as women of color since this country was founded, need to stay in the fight. They need to stay on the right side of history. We are in this moment today, challenged in the ways that we are, because folks stepped aside. Folks sat back. It did not hurt them directly. They could not see the pathway between what we were saying all along, that it linked to their daughters, to their granddaughters, that perhaps the very fights, the strong voices that we've come with that have been silenced in too many ways were actually the reflections of their grandmother's voice and of her grandmother's and her grandmother's. This is a moment that we have to seize because the type of vitriol that is coming against the president is happening to women of color across this state, to trans women, to non-binary individuals across this state. And those who come with the courage to fight for the systems to change, I will lift up my dear friend and sister, Taisha Green, who is living the same nightmare that I experienced because you chose to stand up and to push back and to fight for the very things that we are all speaking on now. I see your signs. I thank you for your words. I thank you for your courage in declaring exactly what it is that we need to change this world. But understand that those who choose to take up that fight 
carry a burden greater than any of us can imagine. So how will we support them? How will we love them? How will we have their backs? Because the criticism will come. The misogyny will come. The mixed messages will come, but the hope will rise and the power will grow. So as we go to this booth, as we go to these voting booths in the next couple of days, I want you to be safe. And I want you to realize that even if we win, the fight is far from over. Understand there are so many people who wear identities, who are afraid of what will happen next, even if we win. Even if we win. How will we love ourselves? How will we love Vermonters? to push through the fear and to step into our power. Will you do this with me? Yes. Will you hold the hands of those who choose, whether they be small children, whether they be our elders, who choose to stand up in this moment and say, I am not standing aside. Will you stand with them? We need to end this pain and enter into our power. My body has never had autonomy since we came to this country. And I'm still fighting to move forward. We have always gone back, but I am not standing back. I'm pushing forward. And I hope that you will with me. This is a fight for our economic power. Because as we lose those who look and feel and share identities with me and with so many others, we get pushed out of the workforces, we get pushed out of our political offices, we get pushed out of our communities, and we lose so much. We can no longer lose and work in a spirit of deficit, work in a spirit of scarcity, because there is great abundance in love, joy, and justice. Am I right? So when our rights are under attack, what do we do? When our rights are under attack, what do we do? Stand up, fight back. When our rights are under attack, what do we do? When our rights are under attack, what do we do? Thank you. That is music to my ears and to the people of Vermont. Thank you. Thank you, Kaya. Meg Smith is the campaign finance chair for U.S. Representative Becca Ballant. And Meg, for 10 years, was the director of the Vermont Women's Fund, where she raised over $5 million to support women and girls in Vermont. May I present to you Meg Smith. Hey, everybody. All right, move your arms, get kids, stay warm. You're doing great. I have the tremendous honor to represent Congresswoman Becca Ballant today. It's been exciting and humbling to see the groundswell of support for Becca across the state. But make no mistake, she does not take this for granted. She is in this for the long game. Every day in Washington, D.C., she must work against forces that collude against her. She recently told a group that she still finds herself sometimes to be the only woman in the room, let alone the only openly gay woman. But that does not stop her. Becca's secret sauce is her ability and willingness to find points of intersection with everyone. Yes, I mean everyone. Well, except for Marjorie Taylor Greene, she said she has not been able to crack that nut. And that's a pun I intended. Becca would have been here to herself today. It's been on her schedule for weeks, except a few days ago she got a call from a higher power. Kamala Harris's campaign asked her to go to Pennsylvania to help with the final push. Yeah, 
Let's use all of our collective might and power to wish her well and send Becca Ballant back to the House and Kamala Harris to the White House. Some of you know me from my previous role as director of the Vermont Women's Fund. It was a great experience for me supporting women and girls across the state by giving grants to the nonprofits, the direct service providers that help, who are there to help women at the margins and to break through gender barriers. What I learned through my travels fundraising across the state for the Women's Fund and want you all to know is that we are at a critical inflection point. Women already hold the majority of wealth in this country. It's about $11 trillion, and it's growing exponentially. By 2013, we're going from holding $11 trillion to, uh, to um, oh my God, $30 trillion. The transfer of wealth to women is, is growing in, by leaps and bounds. So now I'm working in the private sector, investing in women entrepreneurs. Many of these women created their own businesses because they had to. They had no other way to provide an income in a rural economy. They're smart, they're ingenious, but they don't have ways to access capital. They can't get it from banks and other means. VC funds give only 2% of their money to women. It's time for us to take our economic power and use it to invest in women. When women succeed, our communities thrive. Sadly, it took 230 plus years for Vermont to send a woman to Congress. That's a history lesson for all of us. It's time we seize our power right now and no longer recount history, but it's time to bend it to our will. Thank you all very much. Thank you, Meg. I am deeply honored to introduce poet and artist Bianca Stone, who is Vermont's Poet Laureate. Bianca. You know poetry has power. <laughs> because Plato himself made a specific point to exclude it from his ideal political system. But I think he also wanted to make a point about paying attention to poetry and its inevitable sneaky endurance into any healthy society. Poetry comes with power of the voice of the individual and it speaks paradoxical truths that can be hard to hear. And those truths bring great solidarity and understanding across binary divides. I come here today to read you a poem. <laughs> Feels great to have a poem spread out across the grounds here. This is a poem I wrote uh, about four years ago, back when we were in a similar crisis, and it remains relevant today. The way things were up until now. I'm bored of all the excuses. I'm bored as Mayakovsky at the Finnish painter's exhibition, barking like a dog through the foreign minister's toast until he cried and sat down, deadly serious. I'm bored as an elegy. I mean, why care at all, speaking as a pitfall in a world of pits? But we do, to the death. We all agree to garden this year. And my raspberry bushes, picked over by the wrens, I'll make them great again. And let America go wild. It'll be all trumpets and leeks and lilacs from here on out. Let's stop paying for it. Let's get it for free. 
Let's plan our victory gardens to supplement grief and boost morale as though something new and uncontrolled were available. It is the original new hot future joy and we're making it out of dough. And the illusion of separateness, let it go back into remission. Just look at you. You look like a resurrected child, a serious drama in a cosmic joke, scarred, masked, dangerous. And what of the new Eucharist? How hungry I always am, but how I long to lack a little bit, though in Walmart, my heart beats a little faster. I want the world to heal up, and the world is a field as if it were indeed flat, curved and caving, as if it were a piece of paper with a Gustav Dore engraving from the Divine Comedy, the one with the silhouettes of Dante and Beatrice standing in front of a blinding, exploding white rose that you realize when looking at more closely is all made up of bodies and wings twisting together, the saintly throng, they like to call it, mashed and hurtling. It's an image of heaven and the creation of angels, but it's frenzied as any image of hell around a divine center, like a drain to the other side of grief, like joy, joy, joy that gets more frantic the more you try to quiet it down. Here's to a joyful next four years. Thank you, Bianca. Please welcome Jessica Barquist, who is the Vice President of Public Affairs for the Planned Parenthood Vermont Action Fund. Jessica. <laughs> Thank you. Woo! It is so good to see you all on this cold gray morning but a brighter, sunnier future is coming, and I can feel her. <laughs> Planned Parenthood believes in showing up for everyone. We believe that you deserve to be in charge of your own health decisions. We believe that trans people should be able to receive gender-affirming care. We believe that young people know their bodies and what is right for them. We know that not everyone who has a uterus is a woman, and abortion is a right that expands beyond the gender binary. We believe in abortion. We know that when people have accurate information, they can make the best decisions for their own bodies and their own futures. Vermont is incredibly fortunate that we have constitutional protections for our reproductive rights. Thanks to voters like all of you, we passed the Reproductive Liberty Amendment in 2022 with overwhelming support throughout the state. There was majority support in every single town in Vermont. We know without a doubt that Vermonters support reproductive freedom. If a federal abortion ban were enacted, it would supersede our constitutional amendment. And that is why abortion is still on the ballot here in Vermont. We need strong leaders representing us in this building behind me and in DC to ensure that our brave little state always fights back. Abortion bans are racist and disproportionately impact the most marginalized members of our communities. 
The United States has some of the worst maternal mortality rates in the world. Black women are three times more likely to die of pregnancy-related causes than white women. Abortion bans disproportionately impact the lives and well-being of black women, as well as gender expansive and trans people who become pregnant. We urge you to get out there, talk to your family, your community, your networks, and tell them why you support abortion. We are no longer going to be quiet, and we are no longer going to hide behind the term women's health care, when what we really mean is abortion. All people deserve access to the care that they need, and that includes abortion. We are never going back. Thank you. Thank you, Jessica. We're not going back. No, we're not going back. So our next speaker needs no introduction. May I introduce to you Senator Peter Welsh. Thanks, thanks. I'm honored to be here. I want to thank Melinda Moulton for get Melinda Moulton, who has shared with us through the decades her own powerful personal experience and transformed that into political action that has benefited so many Vermonters. Melinda Moulton, thank you very much. And you know, I was listening uh, to one of our earlier speakers. Uh, she just had to leave. But I was thinking that 40 years ago, we were only a few days from an election in Vermont. And on election day 40 years ago, Vermont did something it had never ever done before, and it elected Madeline Cunin to be the first woman governor of Vermont. <clears throat> And oh, was she good, then and now, amazing woman. We are only a few days from an election, and America is going to do on this election day on Tuesday what Vermont did 40 years ago with Madeleine Cunin. We are electing Kamala Harris, the first woman governor, president of the United States. Yes, we can, and we are not going back. <laughs> but what we know is this election is much more than about breaking the hardest of glass ceilings. It's really about guaranteeing, recommitting ourselves to the dignity of all people. And no misogyny is going to be allowed. And we have a situation where the rights of women are under assault, and the right of women that they enjoyed as a constitutional right to abortion was actually taken away by the Trump-appointed Supreme Court. And we know how wrong that is. The eloquence of the speakers who preceded me and will follow me have said it all. But I want to say this. Every man has benefited from the help and love of a woman, a mother, a sister, a friend, a partner. And the rights that women are entitled to are our obligation to defend and fight for with them side by side. And we will.
And you know, there's lots of issues in this contest. And there's a lot of room for disagreement about how best to resolve really serious issues on the environment, on health care, on education. But there's no room to compromise on the right of women to have their own power to make decisions about their own body. No room for compromise on that. And what we know in Vermont is that however much we may disagree about some issues, love really does matter. Respect really does matter. And we have a candidate in Kamala Harris who understands that. And we have a candidate in the person whose name will not be mentioned who absolutely defies that, rejects that. So this election, it can be summed up by those wonderful words of Patty's. We are stronger than that. We are kinder than that. We are not going back. Love is stronger than that. Vote on Tuesday. Thank you, Senator Welsh. Please welcome Christine Hallquist, the first openly transgender major party nominee for governor in the United States. Christine. I am a proud and out transgender woman from Vermont. I am deeply concerned about the potential impact of a Trump presidency on civil liberties, particularly for marginalized communities. Vermont has been my sanctuary, and I believe we need to start preparing contingency plans in case Trump gets reelected. Even if he is not, we still have a tremendous amount of work to do to protect our freedoms and reverse the trend that started with his presidency. While in office, Trump threatened to block aid to California if they did not relax pollution controls. He made it clear he will withhold funds from sanctuary cities. He blocked aid from Puerto Rico during Hurricane Maria. He will block federal dollars to Vermont if we do not comply with his fascist agenda. Our first order of business is to pass legislation that ensures our leaders will not surrender Vermont values when he threatens to withhold our federal funds. Specifically, we need to ensure that Vermont does not comprise its, compromise its values in face of these threats. This may involve passing legislation to safeguard our state's autonomy and our Vermont values. Additionally, we should consider stockpiling abortion pills, strengthening the right to protest through new laws, proclaim Vermont as a sanctuary state, and we must collaborate with other blue states to bolster our collective resistance. Joining with other states and providing strong state support for public media are critical steps. In these challenging times, we can draw inspiration from stories like that of Sir Nicholas Winton, who saved children during World War II. Watch the documentary One Life, where Anthony Hopkins does an excellent portrayal of the work to save 669 children from certain death in Nazi concentration camps. I am proud of our state, and I feel safe in Vermont. There are not many places in this country where this is the case. I am grateful for all those who fought before and allowed me to be the first major party transgender gubernatorial transgender for governor. I am a 
afraid for people who are not in Vermont and for those who cannot speak for themselves. I am grateful for the opportunity to stand here in front of you and the ability to join all of you in the fight for civil liberties. We cannot remain silent. Silence is complicity. Thank you. Thank you, Christine. Let us give a warm welcome to Vermont's Attorney General, Charity Clark. Part of my job is giving speeches. I go to conferences and I talk to people outside of the state and I have a line that's kind of a showstopper. I'm gonna read it for you. In every single town in Vermont, a majority of voters voted to enshrine the right to abortion in our Constitution. Every single town. And when I'm with other attorneys general from other states, I can see the jealousy in their eyes. Because Vermont trusts women, Vermont recognizes the humanity of women, and Vermont stands up for women. It has been my honor to serve as your Attorney General, and one of my favorite parts of my job is meeting with school-aged children. I see many here today. I see you, and I am uplifted. Some, as Attorney General, I have also worked to protect Vermont and Vermonters in many ways, including our right to reproductive freedom. Some other Attorneys General in other states want to take the right to abortion away from their constituents, and I condemn any effort to do this to affront any American's freedom. Last year, I sued the FDA to make sure that Vermonters had access to the abortion drug Mifepristone, and I will always fight to protect our right to reproductive liberty. At this pivotal moment in history, I know many of you, like me, fear for our country about the uncertainty in the presidential race, in Congress, in, in the Senate. It is bewildering to feel that parts of this country are so out of step with the values we have here, where we believe in freedom and unity, where we love our neighbor but respect their privacy. I want to reassure you here today, regardless of what happens on Tuesday, I will do everything in my power to protect you and beloved Vermont, to protect our values, our values that center community, cherish our natural world, promote good health and wellness, protect our privacy, invest in our children, the future of Vermont, and freedom. Let freedom ring. Thank you. Kennedy Jensen is a remarkable young woman, a university student who is working towards a double major in sociology and political science with a certificate in women and gender studies. Let's give it up for Kennedy. I am here at this podium this morning simply because when Melinda Moulton asked me to, I said yes. I'll concede that of those speaking, I am by far the least experienced, yet my presence here is still valuable. In conversations around gender inequity, often we focus our attention on microaggressions. We are frustrated by how they compile, how they are constant, and how they are left unacknowledged. But I would suggest that the same is true for micro-opportunities. Invitations to attend, to participate, to vote, to speak, opportunities to occupy temporary seats at an otherwise exclusive table are intimidating. They create discomfort. They place us in environments in which we feel we do not belong, among people to whom we struggle to relate, and they call on us to contribute in ways we have been taught we are unqualified. They are accompanied by a strong sense of self-consciousness. 
We are conscious not to be assertive so as to not be domineering. We are conscious not to have compassion so as to not be overly emotional. We make ourselves smaller, more digestible. We make ourselves more tolerable in intolerant environments. As women, the responsibility to lessen the discomfort that accompanies our presence in these spaces has been our burden to carry. We apologize needlessly. We become accepting of harassment and of exclusion. We become eager to compensate for the inconvenience we have been told that we are. We must set this burden down. We are not responsible for the discomfort. Our presence <laughs> as women in positions of power, if only momentary, challenges the patriarchy. Our mere presence cultivates change. Change is what is uncomfortable. We do not make others uncomfortable. Change is what is inconvenient. We are not inconvenient. And just as microaggressions continuously compile, building upon each other to hold us down, micro-opportunities will continuously compile and build on each other to bring us up. So join me in a continuous effort to capitalize on the micro-opportunities that come my way, to have the courage to embrace them despite the discomfort they are accompanied by, to allow myself to unapologetically create inconvenience. We can consider it exposure therapy for the mansplainers, for the interrupters, for the name callers, bless their hearts. And they're gonna need it, Vermont, because we are not going back. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Kennedy. Amazing. A former chair of the House Human Services Committee, Ann Pugh, ushered through Vermont's biggest reproductive rights legislation in recent years. Anne recently stepped down from the Vermont House after serving for 30 years. May I present to you Ann Pugh. Kennedy is right. When Melinda Moulton asks you to do something and asks you to stand up, you do. Uh, and I thought I was going to feel awkward speaking after so many people, after um, representatives of Becca Ballant, after <clears throat> Senator Welch, after former Governor Kunin. But I tell you, speaking after Kennedy, I think I should sit down right now. There. I see three, if not four, generations out there, and I am so excited. Thank you. Thank you for your courage. Thank you for your commitment to equal rights and, and gender equality. The battle for individual rights of women is one of long standing and none of us should countenance anything which undermines it. Eleanor Roosevelt said those words 80 years ago, and we are still fighting as a group and as individuals. These words written by her, spoken by her, encapsulate the importance of the continuous fight to level the playing field in society where women can exercise, can freely exercise their rights and fulfill their potential without uh, discrimination or oppression. I'm Ann Pugh, a social worker, and as Melinda said, a retired Democratic Vermont state legislator who had the privilege, along with those that preceded me, those who served with me, and those who came after me in this last session to have fought to ensure reproductive justice remains and is in Vermont. Change takes time, and vigilance um, is important, as the quote reminds us. 
uh, we've heard a little bit of history, and I'm going to repeat it. Because Vermont, we have a lot to be proud of. In 1972, the Vermont Supreme Court overturned the 122nd year, uh, year old law that made abortion a crime in the state. This was the result of the landmark case, Beecham v. Leahy, which featured um, Jacqueline R., an unmarried server who wanted an abortion, and Jackson Beeson, an OBGYN resident at the University of Vermont. The next year, in 1973, the Vermont Supreme Court, I mean, excuse me, the U.S. Supreme Court decision in Roe v. Wade made legal, um, abortion legal across the United States, and Vermont could no longer regulate abortion in the first trimester. In 1988, Vermont began providing public funding for medically necessary abortions when the state Supreme Court ruled that with refusing to pay um, as part of Medicaid was against the state constitution. We had to wait until, nine, until 2014 when the Vermont legislature ex expressly repealed the pre-Rose statute that had imposed criminal penalties on third parties who assisted with or performed an abortion. In 2009, beginning to see what was on the national um, highlight, um, with the passage of House Bill H-57, Vermont enacted comprehensive abortion rights protection into its state law. And what Thanks to you all out here and to the um, voters across the state, as others have indicated, in 2022, Vermont um, voters approved Proposition 5, the Reproductive Liberty Amendment. I'm going to read it because it's really important. The Vermont Constitution now states that an individual's right to personal reproductive autonomy is central to the liberty and dignity to determine one's own life course and shall not be denied or infringed unless by a compelling state interest achieved by the least restrictive means. This amendment to our state constitution is one of the most, if not the most, protective of the full right of abortion and personal reproductive liberty of any in the United States. This is about freedom. The freedom for those of us who call Vermont home to decide when and whether to have children, to become pregnant and carry in pregnancy to term, to choose or to refuse sterilization, and to choose or refuse contraception. The importance of this constitutional amendment can't be underestimated. Our work did not stop then. I was not part of this. Many of you were in terms of your advocacy and your thoughts. Um, but I want to give thanks to those hardworking legislators, who, most of whom aren't here now because they're out knocking on doors. Uh, there are some Democratic seats that are um, at issue, um, and I encourage, and so those people are out there knocking on doors and making sure that each one um, of our rights are protected. But what they were busy in 2023, Vermont enacted interstate shield laws to protect providers, patients, and others who help access abortion and gender-affirming care by revising Vermont's court procedures to protect providers of abortion or gender-affirming care to patients who reside in states where such care is restricted or illegal. For we can celebrate and we can be proud that Vermont is a welcoming state. And these laws um, also protect um, access to self and effective abortion medication regardless of federal approval.
while the right to abortion, justice, and autonomy, um, and particularly abortion care, is a fundamental right in Vermont, in state after state, and at the national level, it has been and it continues to be under serious attack. Those, those people in Vermont and elsewhere who proudly say, I'm not going to vote for he who shall remain nameless, but I'm not sure who I'm going to vote for. I'm sorry, that's cowardice. There is no choice. The decision is clear and um, to vote for Kamala. And I want to say for those of us of a certain age who remember Ralph Nader, when we let um, perfection um, make it so that good doesn't happen, look what the results were. We lost the presidency then. So um, I want to really say this is a choice between two people, and you know the choice, the decision to make. The decision is to vote for Kamala. And again, while we have much to be proud of and to celebrate in Vermont, just yesterday, uh, ProPublica reported on, um, on a woman who died a year ago, they just, found, they just were able to look at the data, a young woman, 18. Um, this is the second case of a pregnant woman being denied, needed health care related to her pregnancy. Um, she suffered, um, in this example, the woman was suffering from septus and was turned away from uh, the emergency room two times, twice before doctors on the third um, visit after two ultrasounds to make sure that her fetus no longer had a heartbeat before they would even allow her into intensive care. This 18-year-old died within hours. This is what happens when abortion care is not available. We have much to celebrate, but we cannot forget the struggles of others. In this in this turbulent time, we need to sing louder. You are the choir. We need your voice. We won't go back. Thank you so much. Thank you, Anne. May I introduce Jaina Ossoff, who is the Vermont Director of the National Council for Incarcerated and Formerly Incarcerated Women and Girls Free Her. Hello, powerful women, femmes, and allies. I am honored to be here, standing with all of you, to not only celebrate our collective power, but uplift the voices of the invisibilized woman and share a crucial reminder that we are them and they are us. Incarcerated women, unhoused women, Palestinian women, black, and all other disenfranchised women should not be on the periphery of our movements, but the forefront. We are on the precipice of change, and our divine rage has begun to transcend into revolution. But as we blaze ahead, we must not forget about all women, but instead become inspired by the endless possibilities that will result from centering the most vulnerable among us. Vermont has a proud tradition of leading in human rights, and further, the Women's March Network is committed to ensuring everyone has the freedom to lead empowered lives in safety and security. But how can we claim these titles and achieve these visions if we continue to rely on the prison system that fails to protect women? We have a choice. Vermont can and should be a leader in ending the incarceration of women. We, woo! 
We can demonstrate to the rest of the country that there is a path forward to a new world by taking the bold step of abolishing women's prisons. What can be our first step towards such an audacious goal? No new women's prison. And we must encourage feminist and women's organizations to understand that advocacy for our rights and reproductive health must include those inside. Every woman deserves the right to make choices about her body, to have a family, which long prison sentences cruelly deny, and to live free from fear and violence. We have heard heartbreaking stories from our sisters inside around the struggle of breastfeeding in prison, the lack of access to postnatal care that in some cases has caused women to almost die, gender-based violence from staff, and the inherent trauma of being separated from their children and families. Reproductive injustice, violence, women working for cents on the dollar, all these abuses and injustices that occur on the outside of prisons are intensified and concentrated within them. This system reinforces and normalizes the abuse of us. As Angela Davis reminds us, prison abolition is a feminist struggle. Abolition feminism introduces us to a global movement of survivors, overwhelmingly black, brown, queer, and trans, who realized decades ago that violence in the home cannot be solved by violence from the state. This is a call to action and a challenge to those who see abolition and feminism as separate or even incompatible politics. In closing, the election is just the beginning and our efforts must transcend the election. And we must remember that we always hold the power. Let's harness our collective energy, passion, and strength to pave the way for a future where all women are free and empowered. Thank you. Thank you so much. Now, without further ado, here's Senator Bernie Sanders. Thank you. Let me thank all of you <coughs> for coming out. Let me thank Melinda Moulton, not only for organizing this event, but for her years and years of service to the people of Vermont. Thank you, Melinda, very much. Uh, as somebody who has been traveling around the country, doing everything I can to see that Kamala is elected president, I don't have to tell anybody here that this is the most consequential presidential election in our lifetimes. And in the next few days, we've got to get on the phone, we've got to knock on doors here in Vermont and our friends all over the country to make sure that we do everything that we can to make sure that Trump is defeated and Kamala is elected. And you've all heard from previous speakers the reasons why. Trump is a demagogue who is undermining American democracy. And mark my words, on Tuesday night, no matter what the election results are, Trump will get up there and say, the only reason I lost this state or that state was because of voter fraud. He is lying, he is a demagogue, and he will do anything, including breaking all of the rules to win this election. We cannot allow that to happen. And I don't have to tell anybody here that since the inception of this country, way back when, women have been struggling to be first-class citizens. And I can remember not so many years ago, if you could believe it, in the United States Senate, 100 people, 98 of them were men, not so many years ago. But women struggled politically. Women struggled economically to demand the right to do any kind of job they wanted, to get any kind of education they wanted. That's what the struggle is about. And of all of those struggles, 
The most important was the right to control their own bodies. And now we have Donald Trump running around the country boasting about how proud he is that he appointed three right-wing Supreme Court justices to override Roe v. Wade. Well, we should be extremely proud that here in Vermont we have put in our Constitution the right of women to control their own bodies. But that's a right that has got to take place in 49 other states as well. And we're going to lead the effort here in Vermont to make that happen. But brothers and sisters, it is this campaign is not only defending democracy, it's not only women's rights. Understand, and we have been hit hard by climate change here in Vermont. We've seen what's happened in North Carolina, Florida, all over the world. Donald Trump despite all of the scientific evidence, believes that climate change is a quote-unquote hoax. And what that means, if God forbid he's elected president, the fight against climate change is over. Because if the United States, the largest economy on earth, withdraws from that fight, China will withdraw, Europe will withdraw, and God only knows the kind of planet that our kids and future generations will inherit. And then it's not only women's rights, it's not only climate change. At a time of massive income and wealth inequality when the people on top have never ever had it so, bit, so good, Donald Trump wants to give massive tax breaks to the richest people and the billionaire class. So the choice could not be clearer. And our job, by the way, is not only to elect Kamala, but the day after to take a Vermont vision to the country which says that health care is a human right, not a privilege. Which says that we are going to get big money out of the political process, get rid of Citizens United, and move to public funding of elections. So brothers and sisters, there's an enormous amount of work to be done. Let's elect Kamala on Tuesday. Let's go forward. Let's transform this country. Let's make America the kind of great nation we know we can become. Thank you all very much. So we have with us now Dwight and Nicole, Vermont's amazing and fabulous singer-songwriters to bring us home. Thank you for being here. Thank you so much for being here. Oh my gosh. Wow, wow, wow. Thank you all so much for having us. It is such an honor to be here and to be able to seal this energy with some music for you. Uh, I feel the pleasure and the hope and the power that's here, just here, standing here amongst all of you right now. This is a crowd of people who are leading with their hearts as well as their minds and understand the power of connecting those two things in order to move forward. That's what we need here. That's what we have here. And as Bernie just said, bringing that energy forward and to the rest of the nation, letting it spread as heart energy can spread. This is the most important thing that we are tasked to do, to remember that, to stand together and bring that into the future. That's what we have to do. Using our imaginations is not just a play thing. This is our power. We have to see it. We have to see it, and then we have to be it. So bringing that forward is our biggest task. 
With that said, I'm going to play some music for you. This is a song I wrote before my 30th birthday, which is a little bit ago now. <laughs> and I realized the mo my mother's words and my grandmother's words and the power of having something to say and saying it. The song is called On Top of the World. classic song. Before we go here today, using our imaginations, we're going to see it, and then we're going to be it. All right? All right. Yeah. The song is called That Last by one of my heroes, Miss Ellie James. You're going to see it with me, right? Yeah! 
folks. <laughs> what can I say, huh? Is that amazing? Woohoo! All right. Now go vote. Have a great day. And thanks for being here. <laughs>